One of my greatest fears is that my life doesn't make a story. If I climbed the mountain, it would be a story of inspiration, but if I died trying, it would be merely a cautionary tale. In assembling the story of this climb, it was immediately apparent that the difference between fiction and reality is that fiction has to make sense. This story was nonsensical. The pieces of the plot failed to fit the classic mountain climbing narrative. What I had, instead of a story of triumph, was a story of introspection, because this time we had a lot of time to sit in the tent and think. The story did have some of the elements of a mountain film. Gross bodily functions. Uh, excuse me. Danger. Whoa, Brian. Look out the other side, dude. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? Bad camera work. How do you make it not so zoomed? <laughs> there we go. Fighting with Sherpas. No, 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 we'll come from camp one to here. Camp one to here. Right? Yeah. Because camp one to here down is no problem. Okay. But the problem is we'll have our own backpacks, which we can fill up with most. We Epic drone shots and crashes. <laughs> Colorful local characters. <laughs> Yet, nonetheless, assembling this expedition into a coherent story has been difficult. Life is often incoherent, so how do you tell the story? Okay, just, just, just start talking, just tell the story, just start. Okay, so one of the interesting things about Janakot is it's remote and it's pretty big. It's like one of the bigger unclimbed mountains left in the world. It's a lot of suffering just to get to the mountain. And I thought uh, not a lot of people are going to want to put up with that to climb this peak. Dan was certainly right about that much. Not many people would put up with the combination of a grueling approach, total remoteness, and danger that a climb of Janukot would provide. The climb was the brainchild of Brian Hylinski, whose friends would all use the word driven in a list of adjectives to describe him. When I first met Brian in 2002, I was also driven. But in the years since, I have definitely mellowed. Now, I don't like to get up in the morning. Brian is the guy with the alarm clock. I made it to the top of the couloir. Uh, and I left about 1 o'clock, I guess, 12.30, 1 o'clock. Brian even dragged his whole family on a winter expedition to the Himalaya. It was the kind of experience where he had to keep reminding people, you will appreciate this later. So yeah, he's driven. I was there. Brian was even briefly a star of Korean television for his expeditions to the Himalaya when he led the dedicated everyman team to attempt Janukot. The mountains constantly force us to make the ultimate choice. Continue fighting and challenge ourselves, or give up. But Brian is no mere everyman. The everyman doesn't get up at 2 a.m. to go freeze his fingers and toes and possibly die on a huge unclimbed peak. So last night, about midnight, I woke up. Pardon me, midnight. Climb this couloir and pick up this ridge. I'm more like the everyman. Brian is extraordinary, which is exactly what I was afraid of. I didn't want to climb this mountain with someone who is totally determined to get to the top. How's it going, buddy? Hey, man. How's it going? Years of having close calls and being party to accidents has left me overly fearful and cautious. Oh, dude, you need head cam because uh, you're going to get the pow pow. The pow pow. I don't do, do teletubby. <laughs> All right, mate, I'm going. Woo! Yeah! Slut! I just knocked off that avalanche myself. Crazy. Lost both skis. 
super on. The combination of Januk's reputation for difficulty and Brian's drive to climb it had me a bit worried when the invitation to join the expedition rolled around. My worries were eased when I started training with Dan, the other team member for the expedition. It seemed like pretty natural that John and Dan would be good teammates, like just their banter and um, just the way that they get along, their humor together, <laughs> like they are just always cracking jokes and um, kind of bouncing ideas off of each other and just cracking us all up. <laughs> and even temperament, like from both of them, like and sort of this, sort of like a shared norm of like mountaineering expectations. Like they seemed to really know what they were doing and um, have kind of like similar standards for, for safety and for just yeah, how the trip should Good go. Work. Nice Tyrolean. Forgot to back it up though. Oops. Almost died. By the time June rolled around, I felt good about the team and our chances on the mountain. It was time to fly to Leh in northern India to begin adjusting to altitude. Ladakh is the place where cultures collide. He looks like a dog, kind of. I thought it was a dog when I first looked at him. Dude, look at his gnarly toenails. Um. Wow, those things are beastly. I was really excited when John and I were talking about doing a climatization trip. Uh, I, I thought Lay would be an interesting place to go. I wanted to go back. I really enjoyed it. We went to Lay previously. Uh, I really like this city. It's like a, a Buddhist city, kind of like an oasis in this super dry landscape. Last time we took a bus, like a five-day bus to get to Lay, four-day bus. This time around, to save time, John and I flew into Lay from Delhi, and we met Jeff there. It was time to leave Lay and head out for an acclimatization trek and warm-up peak in the hopes that our climb of 6,100 meters Stoke Kangri would prepare us physically and mentally to climb the much more demanding Janukot. <laughs> I feel kind of like the princess sometimes because I'm the girl that has to, people have to take care of, like, you know, first mountaineering trek. I had some challenges along the way for sure. Um, there were some of my like challenges that I expected, like I have this sort of mystifying irrational fear of bridges <laughs> that definitely showed up a few times during the, the trek. Uh, personally when I'm walking all day my thoughts change from uh, wondering what people are doing back home to complete blankness to then just focusing on breathing. Um, yeah, it's pretty peaceful out here and pretty disconnected from life back home. Oh, I've never done anything like this before and I'm not a climber or a trekker. This is the biggest uh, hiking trip I've ever been on. So I will have a lot to tell people. Um, this region is beautiful. There's a lot of snow-capped mountains and the landscape is just very stunning. After a seven-day trek, we reached Stoke Kangri Base Camp, a crowded and somewhat polluted patch of earth beneath this 6,000-meter peak. It was time to decide who would try for the summit. On the summit day, um, 
every all the conditions were kind of different. Like instead of trekking during the day, we had to sleep during the day and start at night. Um, and and you know use gear that I wasn't really that familiar with using. Um, so I was I was really freaked out. <laughs> so what are you um, what are you scared of? <laughs> Do you sleep good? Yeah, I had some like terrifying nightmares, but otherwise I slept okay. <laughs> um, didn't didn't Bottle say that people like get really injured sometimes? <laughs> get really injured yeah. on this mountain? Mm -hmm. um, only people from Singapore. <laughs> what happened to the Singaporeans? When we, let's see, when we did it, I think we set off John, Nina, uh, Bottle, and another uh, Sherpa set off to do it. And it was pretty casual. It just, we knew it was gonna be a hard day. Oh, wow. What's up? The five of us started going and uh, when we reached the glacier, uh, we started to kind of figure out, you know, is this going to be a good idea for us all to continue? Um, how difficult is this? How are you feeling? And at that point, um, Nina made a decision that, you know, might be better for her to go down. So she went down with another porter. I have to try this, you know, there's, I was just kind of stubborn, I guess. <laughs> like, I never really gained enough confidence to, to like, continue. All right. Good job, Dan. Nice job, John. So we're on the top of Still Congaree, uh, almost 6,200 meters. Kind of a chilly morning. Lots of clouds, don't need our glasses. Pretty windy, pretty cold. And be successful at altitude. So I thought after doing Still Congre that John and Kat would be doable. We got back to Lay. Uh, my girlfriend had been trying to contact me. I was really concerned, like, why she was trying to contact me, but I found out that uh, we were going to have a baby. And uh, I was going to skip the second part of the trip because uh, I'd quit my job to come on the expedition, and I realized at this point that if I was going to be a dad, I needed to come back and get a new job. So I kind of kept everything to myself and continued on the rest of the day hanging out in Lay with John and Nina. Uh, the next day, John and I continued on to Delhi and we met up with Brian, who I uh, hadn't seen in several months. And it was a nice reunion, we hung out for a few hours and then as we started talking logistics for the next portion of the trip for going to John and Kat, uh, I stopped everybody and let them know that I was not gonna be continuing on the rest of the trip and I was gonna be going back to Korea. No one knew what to think of it because it sounded like an absurd joke, uh, which is something I totally would, would do. But uh, maybe after about 10 minutes, everyone kind of accepted what I was saying. And uh, yeah, at that point, I started making plans to go back to Korea that day while everyone else was making plans to continue on to Janukat. We moved on without Dan taking trains and buses to the headwaters of the Ganges River, the most sacred site for Hindus, where we would begin the long approach to unclimbed Janikot. Brian slept through most of this because he was jet lagged, so we didn't talk much. On the inside though, I was freaking out. I think with three people, it's always nice because you always have one mediator in case there's any kind of conflict. And when there's just two people, you have the potential for a fight to happen over stupid things, like just the way somebody's chewing their food or some other you know, innocuous thing that becomes incredibly annoying after 10 days stuck in a tent. So I assume that they'd be okay as long as just the typical annoyances didn't get to them. As I trudged over the moraine up toward the Gangotri Glacier, short on oxygen and slightly worried, I hoped that Dan was right.
After more than 30 kilometers of glacier travel, we reached our advanced base camp where we were to spend the next three weeks attempting to identify and ascend a climbing route to the summit of this complicated mountain. Signs of climate change were ever present as the glacier melted beneath us and avalanches raked the flanks of Janukot. We busied ourselves with organizing gear and planning a strategy until finally the monsoon descended upon our tiny tent for a very long time. Rains are here. How many days has this rain been going on now? At least seven. Uh, how many days have we been stranded in this tent? Three. And we have what to eat? Where's our food? Oh, the only food we have left is this. How many bars are in there? Uh, I got a couple more outside. Okay. Three bars. Tent life. Been in the tent for a couple of days now. Good times reading books, listening to podcasts. Last night we woke up and it was about time to start our climb, but it was raining. We're well fed, but we're running out of food. Our last five days of food is up high, where so we can climb. Um, but yeah, we got oatmeal and pro bars. It's kind of like a Pavlovian response at this point, right? Because we've got food up high, so if we climb, we get food. Yeah. It's like the little, little, little rats that ring the bell and get a pellet. Right. That's us. Other than that, it's we both smell pretty good. We don't seem to smell each other, so that's nice. Brian forgot his toothbrush at base camp, so it's been, what, you're like t five days now, seven days without Seven days without brushing Seven eyes. days without teeth. teeth so John has stopped kissing oral, me. Oral hygiene. Oral hygiene. John has stopped rolling over the middle of the night making out with me because I, my breath is too bad. Yeah, old mossy mouth over there. Good times. Uh, the, the thunder of... Rockfall oh, continues to be a constant entertainment, yeah. peeking our head out every 15 minutes to see where it's coming from. Luckily, it's not coming from our roof, um, so we have yet to see any super bad rockfall or avalanche on our route. Every night, we would sit in the tent, and Brian would tell stories about when he used to live in Thailand. Secretly, I hoped that the weather would continue to be awful so that we could bail early and hit the beach. I would dream about it when the alarm clock would go off and we would have to go climbing. Hey, tomorrow is our drop dead day to go back down or at least start giving up, but it started opening up yesterday and tonight you can't really see it too well. The deferg, the deferg. The fog is coming back, but uh, it's been clear all day. Saw stars tonight, we can see all the way to the summit. And uh, in about five hours, we're gonna get up and start carving our way through the ice fall. And uh, yeah, man, for the last 10 days, we've been really depressed thinking this thing was done and we weren't even gonna have a shot. Uh, but we persevered and uh, we're gonna take a <laughs> shot at it. Nice. so wet you know with cramp we had to have crampons on because we were climbing up and over uh, a bunch of falls as well as various boulders we had a, we had one section we had to climb down into a bit of a crevasse and up the other side um, and so we needed our crampons but at the same time every time our crampons came into contact with a foot and a half of snow it was like swinging a cinder block so our, our uh, crampons kept getting balled up. Uh, we tried taking them off up here, but it wasn't much better. So uh, we pitched our tent here in the middle of two crevasses. We look pretty good. Uh, we got some food in us. We feel pretty rested. And it looks like the clouds have cleared again. We had a lot of sun this afternoon. We just got to camp 2.5. <laughs> bivy. Not a camp, and, it's a bivy. Uh, it's a bivy, not yeah. a camp.
This could qualify as a camp. This is a pretty good camp spot. We're, we're almost out of food, man. Three days. Pretty much from the moment we left camp at 2 a.m. this morning, we were post-holing. We were hoping to get out of here at 1. Didn't happen. Had some issues with the stove tonight. But we worked them out. And we got about seven hours to get over this, uh, get up this snowfall, which is probably about 2,000 feet snow field. Otherwise, uh, uh, the torrents are going to be coming down. I complained for most of those 10 and 10 pound days, but our final day of climbing was one that I will remember for the rest of my life. We got up early and went for it with all of our gear, planning to make one more bivy, then go for the summit. Yeah. In case shifts are coming down. Right. After climbing through the night and well into daytime, Brian and I had a short conversation and made a decision that both of us have pondered many times since. <sighs> Pretty sustained climbing. My calves are a bit on fire. Definitely, uh, Oh, yeah, that was hard. There was a lot that went into the decision, but in the end, the right decision was to turn around. Rough day. We had to turn around and come down. We just don't have enough time. Couldn't find a bivy. Propelling into the unknown. So, we called it a trip. That one's a a little winded, as we both are. I got together with Brian in Leavenworth, Washington, a year after our climb of Janicott, to reminisce, go for a climb, and discuss the decisions of a year before. Yeah. I'd rather fail on a peak like Janicott that tests all of our abilities, challenges everything we know about climbing, uh, everything we've, we've worked for and trained for, um, and then you fail not because of something you weren't prepared for, but because of something that was simply out of your control. And if you can recognize that and turn around, you live to, a, to attempt it another day. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we did. We, every challenge that we faced, whether it be running out of food, bad weather, avalanches, rockfall, crevasses, climate change, whatever you want to label our challenges, we faced each of them and we were ready and we, we made an attempt that I'm proud of. Uh, but in the end, those uncontrolled factors were what turned us around and we made the right decision and we're here to attempt it again some other day. It was getting too risky. It was time to head down. Um, and every mountaineer just lives for that chance to try again. We all love to make it that time, but with every success comes five, 10, 15 failures. Um, and so not only do you live for those successes, but you live for those failures and those opportunities to to address that challenge a couple of years from now and, and let it build up inside of you again and give it another shot. But deep down, I know that Janokot is something I'll always want to do. And you've worked for years at this and, and in all honesty, you failed. So yeah, does it nag at me? Of course, it nags at me probably every day. Um, and I want to go back and I'm completely confident that next year or the year after that, I'm going to go back and we're going to send the face, we're going to send the route we see, and we're going to make the summit. At some point, uh, we'll give it another shot and do it. There might not be a grand narrative about something so complicated as life. Ultimately, our stories and memories might be best understood as a series of moments that provide connection, which is as much explanation as maybe we need. 
The story is contained in that glance from Brian that says he's just as scared as I am, or the scarf that Dan buys for Jennifer so many miles away at home. Life should be an adventure, and who you choose to share your stories with might be more important than the stories themselves. This actually is the first night we've been able to see stars in about 10 days. It's enjoyable. Oh,